Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day. This year's VRIC is now in the books. It was an amazing event. We're going to be having the different speakers, the different panels, everything from the conference is going to be coming to you right here on this channel. So stay tuned. But of course, we are continuing with our series of online expert panels. And I'm really excited for what we've got lined up for you guys today. We have Francis Hunt, aka the Market Sniper and Trader Ferg. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having us, Jesse. It's a pleasure to, to have you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you both here. Um, I'd like to talk about what you guys are currently watching in the commodity space, talk about some unloved and obscure assets that the market isn't paying attention to. And let's just start off with your broad view of the commodities complex at present. How do you see the space positioned at the moment? Obviously, we hear a lot about the narrative of you know overvalued tech stocks are going that that whole sector is going to roll over and eventually we're going to see a transition to real assets in the form of commodities depending on who you talk to some people think it's going to be an epic commodity super cycle i'm wondering what your thoughts are there on how you see commodities currently positioned versus the broad market and francis i'll start with you on this one ah uh, yes thank you so uh as i was mentioning um oil a little bit benign. The energies that are relying on a retail consumer um, di are direct to source, which is oil, which is your travel, transports, cars, uh, packaging. Uh, I'm a bit more concerned for that. As as you were mentioning pre-starting uh, uranium, obviously on a, a bit of a flyer, I'll point out that goes to plants and that's grid supply. Uh, and there might be a bit of a rotation in the sector there. So generally, I prefer the monetized commodities uh, at the moment. I'm really uh, aggressively bullish gold. I'm expecting a move up in gold. And I'm expecting, as I, as I say, my truck and trailer thesis with the bungee cord, that uh, silver, while it stretches and is hanging back, uh, is going to have a phenomenal year. It's just going to uh, it's going to be post when gold reasserts. So we've, we're really bullish still uh, gold. That's a near term one. I mean, I could pivot to charts at a later point if you want us to do the deep dive, but there's actually a setup coming that I think in the next few weeks, we're going to get well through the 2200s. All the people that highlighted that big slamming wick that we got, I point out that we now are building bases well above the 2000s, where previously at a monthly candlestick level, we couldn't hold above 2000. It's all part of the slowly each stage, you know, first it's resistance. Then you pivot around it and then you sit above it and you wind up for the new legs up. So everything we've said in our gold view is unchanged. So a lot of these things, are these are oil tankers. That's why I like macro technical commodities, uh, technical charting generally. So the bullish the gold and I think in due course uh, that's going to filter through on the silver. I'll highlight that leasing rates on silver, which is the industrial demand, uh, as, 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 is as high as it was in 2008 which led to the big run-up uh, that subsequently finished in the uh, upper 40s. Uh, so that is a, a, that's another shoe to drop. People keep going, oh, you're still talking about silver. We've been holding that bag for ages. Nothing happens. There's that cynicism. And nothing happens, much like uranium, until it suddenly does. And I know uh, a couple of you are noting that uranium is obviously in a very strong move uh, at, the, at the moment. So, yeah, let me just leave it there and uh, hand over to Fergus. Yeah. And Ferg, your thoughts on what commodities you're watching at the moment. Also, if you have any thoughts on the broad market at present, the S&P and the NASDAQ, they seem to keep slowly grinding higher as people are pounding the table that it's inevitable that they're going to have a massive correction. So I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are there as well. Yeah. So I'm just loving everything I'm seeing at the moment, honestly. This is, um, this is kind of my dream scenario in that where having some of the commodities that positioned early in the likes of uranium really gained traction well there's still some fantastic opportunities and some of the really hated stuff so it was always it's always sort of a would be a beautiful outcome if you had some stuff run that gets to sort of um the extremes of valuation where i'm un, un sort of uncomfortable holding it and i can rebalance into other stuff that i have high conviction and love so between when i'm talking about that i'm meaning Uranium at the moment is obviously gaining traction. I love everything I've seen with it. I think it's um, there's going to be there's going to be a squeeze, especially of what we've seen out of Kazataprom lately, and there's going to be a real fight over 
um, the remaining pounds on the market. And yet we've got um, the oil market, I think we're at least a year before it can really gain traction. I just see too much spare capacity. Um, I see a weak year for coal, perhaps um, with the exception of MET. And I think it's going to be a lovely year for continuing to accumulate and even maybe taking some slices off those which are outperforming. As for the, the broad market, I just um, I continue to see a lot of the stuff that everyone is pouring into, the Magnificent Seven, just having its reckoning. I've um, been quite verbal on the just the way passive works is passive has essentially um, cornered a lot of the floats of these large, um, the sort of the Magnificent Seven and driven them to extreme levels. And there just simply isn't the active investors to take them off um, their hands at these elevated um, valuations. And the fact is, the majority of the active investors that have hung in the game is because of um, they've loaded the boat with it as well. I saw one uh, Bank of America survey where 85% of fund managers, active fund managers, are holding Microsoft. Like, how do you how do you rebalance when everyone's that side? And I I think you could see some real ear pockets um, as they have to rebalance. Um, but I think that's probably still a little way out. So I'm just trying to use this time uh, to keep acquiring everything that I see is kind of just starting to um, leave the sort of the bottom crawling scenario, the likes of um, some of the offshore service companies, some even shipbuilders were the last sort of bottom crawlers. I've sort of been positioning in a few of those. I'm just, um, I'm, I'm loving the valuations. I'm loving the runway of getting with these and um, just, sort of ignoring all the, the hype and all the FOMO going on in uranium. I was positioned in that for the better part of sort of four years now. And so that's um, the idea of sort of chasing it here is not how you make money. So yeah, that's my current view. Yeah, well, let's hone in on uranium for a moment because obviously making a lot of headlines, spot price of uranium breaking $100 a pound, um, which is hasn't been seen in 15 years or so, the equities ripping at at the close of of last week on Friday, um, and they'd been steadily going up. You know the the quality names had been going up anyways over the course of twenty twenty three, and then now we're off to an incredible twenty twenty four. You mentioned not chasing FOMO for somebody who's maybe new to the sector or or hasn't um, invested yet. Do you think this is a time to be patient and potentially wait for pullbacks? Do you think we might be overbought here? And where do you think the best value currently lies? In uranium, would it be you know taking the time to do dil due diligence on the explorers, um, or would it be developers, producers, or would you just not touch the sector right now? And Ferg, I'll start with you. Yeah, so I always get people angry when I talk about this stuff because it's it's just my style, and I say you've kind of missed the train. The train left the station a while ago, and that that's not to say there's not great returns to be made for certain people getting in now like this i'm sure there's lots of um juniors where you still have multi-baggers it's just the way i like to position is i like to go in when the sector's completely washed out i like to like um sort of bottom fish and then i know the majority of my returns are going to come sort of three plus years along and where when i'm seeing this sort of fomo um playing out i know i want to be in sectors that the capital's almost getting pulled out of. Like I said, I was looking at some of the AS, um, ASX stocks today and some of the ones that I love that are outside of uranium, they're obviously people are selling to chase uranium. And so I want to be diving into some of the um, some of the few sort of oil and gas stocks um, there that are um, people are sort of FOMOing out of and they're giving me even better valuations. So it's not what anyone ever wants to hear because it's the most comfortable thing to sort of chase something that's going up 10% a day. Um, but really, that's not how you make money in this game. You've got to position early and now's time to be positioning and the thing that'll be doing what Uranium's doing in another another two, three um, years. And I think that's, that's going to be the um, fossil fuel complex. It's going to be the likes of... Um, Gold and silver, even I, I kind of want to get a bit more exposure to the likes of silver. I think that's a great looking setup. And 
also all the sort of derivatives of oil, whether it's yeah, the service companies, whether it's um, product tankers, dirty tankers, um, yeah, so and OSVs, rigs, all of it. Um, I just want to be all over that at the moment and um, even probably sooner rather than later take the first slice off uranium because I've been running quite a high sort of proportion of my portfolio uranium and I, I do want to sort of get that back more into a sort of a, a sort of a more of a equilibrium, a sort of a third uranium, a third coal, third oil and gas is what I've always aimed for. And so with this sort of outperformance means it'll make it easier to do earlier, especially if the, there's weakness on the stuff I'm looking at. Yeah, that's a really good philosophy, having that long-term time horizon and being willing to wait, especially in this age of social media, people are posting about prices going up or down every single day, which is completely insane. It just doesn't make sense. Unless, of course, you're a short-term trader. Um, Francis, I know you do some trading and you're very successful at that. So why don't you discuss uh, uranium for us from a technical perspective? I know you've got a, a chart you wanted to bring up to talk about it and, and let us know your current thoughts on the sector. I, I think the instincts that Fergus were reflecting are on the money. Um, if you can enable the screen, uh, Jesse, I'll uh, sh I'll show you. Um, yeah. At the moment, the price behavior is just starting to get uh, blow off ish. In other words, it's it's moving uh, very high percentages per day, uh, and that's um, that's usually a sign that um, uh, you know things are getting a little bit too uh, excited. Um, and and as a result, um, I would say you want to uh, play it safe. Here we go. So I mean, this was a setup. Uh, in fairness, we were we were so just taking. Uh, I think Fergus on the fundamentals and people like Rick Rule are far more over this. Um, we know that it was a battered uh, industry uh, market, and then it uh, came right. Technically, at one point, it had us tiny bit confused. It looked like it had had quite a leg up and it might actually rest. But what it's done is this continuation pattern, and that's typically our target at the 27. And since uh, the run of the 27, which this is a, a two-day chart, so the last three candles are essentially six days. So it's about a trading week, maybe plus one. And you've kind of gone from 27 to 32. Now, think about that in percentage terms. You know, you, you're you about $3 uh, to 20. And another, that's about $5 on $27. Uh, you're heading for 15, almost nearly, but in the 15, 20% range in a week. Um, that has a distinct whiff of blow off and panic buying. And unfortunately, the next stage to follow that for the longs are in, in our general experience is, is some form of, you know, final blow off. So it could spike even further. It's not to say we're calling it right at the moment, but I would, I would, I think the instincts Fergus uh, was reflecting of j just taking some off and rebalancing away from uranium. It's not a bad idea. Uh, that doesn't mean the whole move is over. You can have a blow off, you get a bit of a smackdown, then you wind up again, and then you can go again. So it's not a it's not a call to exit entirely, but it's a it's it's maybe a good rebalancing point uh, because it's getting too mainstream of view that kind of uh, chase up. Uh, this is on the Sprott physical uranium I'm looking at. That's just my proxy that seems to generate good charts, but it's been one of the better ones as well. Um, so that was on um, uranium. Uh, I'll just bring up the gold again, just to technically back up maybe uh, what we were saying on the uh, gold and silver side of things. Gold has yeah. to run first. We call it kind of a God market uh, in general. So, you know, uh, it, it is the boss. It shifts first, but then when the others finally catch up, it, uh, it trots a lot more. So I'll just jump on to uh, the gold chart there and get it, get them up. One sec. Let's see what we've got. Uh, and this is the structure that's quite interesting me on a smaller time frame. But before I do that, I just want to remind everybody of the weekly and the monthly setup. Many people have seen this chart many, many times, but uh, no time before had you closed on a monthly uh, above that 2k level 
And not only whilst we did get pushed back, we're holding above that now. Uh, on This is on a monthly time frame. And that was the last high of 2011 uh, 12. So actually, it's got a lot more that it can do. And we've we've called for a move up to the next 3k level to come in pretty steady, uh, short succession. You know, the notion of rate cuts means that debt values have to go up. Many people forget that for rate cuts to take place, debt values have to go up, but who's going to be buying all this debt. So we're a little bit more um, less uh, in, inhalers of the old pivot narrative and the scale of it. I think there could be a lot of disappointment around that. Uh, we're hyper over indebted and that isn't going to change. And people's desire for debt, given what's happened, you've had three or four events now, the UK pensions, the no bid Bank of Japan market. Uh, and then, of course, you had the intermediaries of banks going bust earlier and banks are the intermediaries. Uh, of debt origination so uh, of last year. So I think uh, the whole world has turned. The 40-year debt market is over. I, I truly say this is one thing that if you agree and we get right, is going to continue to serve you year in, year out until we've had a collapse. I don't think we get a 40-year gradual unwind like you had the 40-year uh, um, inflation process. I think you that's the escalator and the elevators coming. This is the gold I was talking about. We kind of like the structure. Everyone got, ah, oh, you see you gold bugs when it got slammed here. But actually, there wasn't that much follow through. Given the technical aspect, I, I would have thought that you would have got pushed sub, uh, you know, 1950 and a lot more. And very quickly, it was rallying back. And this, this is a technical structure that's interesting to us always because it shows uh, an ironing out of the volatility. It's a volatility compression, uh, and you're doing it above after largely holding the 2K level. Um, that spells to me a 2,250, 2,275 next move up, which can overperform uh, immensely as part of a staircase up to the 3K. So gold looks very good, and the biggest buyers are central banks at the moment, and, and uh, you know they don't want to take up treasuries in near the same way. And you've got this polarization with BRICS that don't want to be seen to be supporting the American part of the debt-based system. So uh, China and Russia, I think, are going to continue to be big buyers, and now you're going to see emerging markets doing even more, the Arabs and all of that. So that's the gold narrative, which is uh, setting up pretty well, both from the macro and back down to the daily. So this was a daily setup. Uh, and I think in due course, this turns the gold-silver ratio. So I'll just bring this one in. That I almost prefer it to silver because silver is slightly doldrumy for now. Um, but I think it, the, the tension is building up. We've had, uh, I'm going to take the volume off here for a second and just show you on the weekly time frame. You can see we're congesting and losing. We're in this channel range uh, over here on the gold-silver ratio. And it's, pre it's pretty consistently recently since uh, some way, since, well, when was that? 2022, we're being contained in this upper range. We're coming off every time we hit here. We're coming off every time. And the, the game starts for us for silver, certainly, when we break down through this lower level range in the gold-silver valuation. Remember, it's about eight ounces they find for every in gold. Uh, and the lease rates... It's the industrial demand for silver that's light. So a lot of people are sending back their coins and their five gram bars, but the industrial guys are the guys with a thousand ounces. I'm lucky enough to have a few. And those are pretty rough crude chunks of big ass silver that get melted down, used to make phones and all of that. And you're getting the lease rate starting to spike. It's actually the industrial demand we need as well first. And that will be an additional turbocharger on top of the continued debt crisis, and I can see so many reasons as to why silver at its current price, I probably should show you the silver chart, I'm pretty sure it's not much out of the 23s at the moment, is ridiculously, in our opinion, uh, cheap. And, 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 and there's an assessment very similar to the uh, the uranium market uh, of not so long ago. That doesn't mean it can't dip one more time. It's, so it's trading at 23, 24. We could kiss 22 one more time. There's often a final shakeout, a capitulation just before you go. Uh, and uranium uh, guys will know all about that. So that's that's my technical take. When we break this red line up top here, it's going to be all a very, very interesting time. Uh, and we played with that level when gold broke. 
in silver. So it has triggered a technical break as well. We just wanted to ease a little bit off. And then I think the next time we go, we go big. Uh, so I think it's a great year for the monetized metals. I, I really like those. Great. Well, Ferg, I'd like to get your thoughts as well on gold and silver. You said silver is looking particularly attractive at the moment. And is there any sectors of the market in particular you're looking at when it comes to silver? Obviously, very few pure play silver miners out there. Um, is that a space that you look to? Do you more play the physical metal itself, ETFs? How do you approach the space? So I, I just wanted to jump back quickly to that uranium comment of yeah. um, going out. I, was, I always think it's important to like give timeframes because um, obviously Francis is a bit um, more like technically technically focused on shorter time frames. So when I'm talking of scaling out, I'm talking one, maximum two years. And so I'm just going to ride the volatility. I don't think I'm smart enough to um, see these sort of short-term overbought, underbought. So when I'm talking of leaving the trade, I'm talking of um, sort of 5% slices when I hit, hit certain signals. And so that's, that's over time rather than thinking I'm smart enough to see some um, overbought rally and um, and lighten up. Maybe I'll, I get the timing right by pure luck, but yeah, I'm not smart enough to um, sort of trade it um, intra intra month. Um, even I'm just knowing that I'd be I'd be very surprised if I'm still in the trade in say two years. Yeah, from what I'm seeing, I, I think um, there's going to be a fight over over pounds, and there's going to be um, sort of a retail frenzy and quite a squeeze within that time frame. But to bounce back to your question on silver, I'm I'm not much of an expert. I don't really know, so I um, don't think I could give you a great answer on silver. Other than um, I like the setup, I I think it'll do great things. I think the whole commodity space is going to do great things, and it's just going to be looking back and seeing which were the ultimate winners. My my bets are mainly all with the energy complex, whether it's um, which uranium. Um, coal, oil, and the, the sort of the derivatives of it, whether it's yeah, the services or the sh um, tankers. Um, and as far as I'd be getting exposure with silver, it'd be more via probably just trying to get the biggest bang for my buck on the on a small allocation. So it would be like probably two year call options on sort of a, a junior silver um, ETF, just to to try and minimise my risk of um, doing something dumb with a junior miner, which I'm um, pretty likely to do. I think um, those things are just dumpster fires for shareholder capital 95% of the time, but then there is a time where uh, you want to be there. And so kind of want to toe in the door in case they do what sort of uranium's doing within that time frame. But yeah, I don't, precious metals aren't going to make up a big proportion of my portfolio. I'm sort of talking sub sub 5%. The, the max I could see them getting to would be, Five percent, and that's just because I think, I think overall the energy complex has just been so much more capital starved, and so I see there being a large outperformance similar to what we saw from um, the previous kind of bull market in which the the oil outperformed precious metals by a large margin over um, over that sort of seventies through to twenty twenty. I, I see just the whether it's the ESG, um, whether it's all the the climate agenda, everything just keeping keeping capital out of that sector will mean um, it's gonna it's gonna perform um, it's gonna outperform. That said, I think yeah, everyone will do fine. Whatever commodity they pick, I think if you're comparing it to something like the S and B or the Nasdaq, you'll you'll get your performance. I'm just focused on which is going to be the highest performing um, sector within commodities. What's up, guys? Quick break. My name is Jay Martin. I'm the CEO of Cambridge House and the host of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. I wanted to quickly point your attention to a link right beneath this video where you can subscribe to our new weekly newsletter. If you want to better understand the minds of the best investors in the resource space, subscribe to this newsletter. I author it personally every Sunday and I love writing it. Hit that link below to subscribe. All right, back to the interview. Well, talk to us about the tankers, talk to us about um, offshore oil services and uh, shipbuilders as well. Those are some some things you mentioned that are very obscure to most investors. So maybe you could shed some light on that sector and the opportunity you're seeing there. 
Yeah, certainly. So that's that's probably been my favourite hunting ground the last um, last year or so. You, you get one you get one small window of time in these sort of hyper cyclical sectors where you get a whole sector essentially go bust, and that's what we saw with the, the sort of the offshore drillers, some of the OSVs, and you get this beautiful window where some of them relist, they've wiped out all the debt, they've got net cash on the balance sheet. And you can jump in them on the relisting. So that that was the dream, jumping in some like sort of like diamond offshore, like kind of waded into that as soon as it relisted. Um, and the same happens behind the scenes with a lot of the really tiny ones, but it doesn't really show up as a bankruptcy. It shows up as like a sort of a, a massive recapitalization. So if you bring up the shares outstanding, then they just absolutely um, shit the bed at some point with shares. And then you, you go in after when they're, they're then sustainable. And I've kind of like been critiquing my my whole process there where I want to see them sort of get back to making at least a dollar of sort of net income. I want to see the debt in a manageable setup. Like I want to make sure there's no sort of maturities like about to um, surprise us and um, crush the company. And then, yeah, I'd like generally start out taking small positions and, and building them out as I sort of gain conviction and so some of them are real, like they're just, um, the margin of safety is wonderful. Like I've, I've had some particular offshore companies where there's more cash on the balance sheet than market cap. <laughs> and um, some recently that are just big amounts of net cash and they're just starting to move. And so I can only imagine where they could be in, um, in three, five years. If um, I have patience, I don't screw it up and trade out of them or get, get greedy and sort of try and move the money somewhere else. If I can just ignore them in the corner of my portfolio, like I've tried to do with uranium to this point. Um, it's, and it's hard because if, if you take away what uranium's done in the last few months and you back up a year and it was all coal, everyone was sort of saying like, why the hell are you owning uranium when you could be in, in thermal coal? And now everyone's crying about being in thermal coal and uranium's going gangbusters. It's just got to be very careful of hindsight bias and thinking we're a lot smarter than we are. Like it, it all makes sense when it's happening, but um, looking forward's tough. And so, yeah, I'm just thankful it's playing out. And I think there's there's a lot more good news to come in uranium in the coming months. I think what the um, with Kazaraprom, I think that's largely misunderstood. Obviously, um, Cuppy's been all over it. He's pointed out that the sulfuric acid shortage. I think that's that's kind of an excuse for really they've been um they've been overproducing their assets and this has come to the point where like a sulfuric acid shortage they could fly it in from somewhere if they needed to this is the fact similar to kind of like the shale problem of um you just you you kind of hit a sort of a, a productivity issue at some point and the drop off um really starts to bite you in the ass and i think the um because that problems there and they're they were supposed to get back to 90% this year. They were supposed to get to 100% um, production 2025. And I don't think it's going to happen. And I think the market's going to slowly wrap its head around that and also wrap its head around the fact that there's a lot of players downstream that are relying on those, those pounds and there's going to be a shit fight over it in the spot market. And that's what we're seeing the start of. We're seeing people slowly wrap their head around that. And then once you... Once that dynamic kicks off, um, look out, yeah. And that's what I'll probably be starting to scale out um, of as that really, really kicks into gear. Yeah, because Adam Prom, the world's largest publicly traded uranium producing company for those unfamiliar, currently facing 40%. production woes. Yeah, yeah. And Francis, let's touch on the Nikkei and Japanese stocks. This is another area of the market that is obscure for North American investors in particular. What's the setup and the opportunity you're currently seeing there? Yes. Uh, just before I touch the Nikkei, I just wouldn't mind yeah. taking a, a, a quick point on Fergus's um, reply on um, precious metals and 5% um, and energies being potentially the best of the, the macro uh, commodities. We're both very much clearly in agreement on the commodity cycle uh, being the place to play in. Um, it also, my, my counterpoint to a degree would be, it depends what you expect coming macroeconomically. 
if we get a vicious demand destroying uh, event, we get a pandemic disease X, if we get a number of things, the oils and the other energies, uh, less so uranium, as I mentioned, it's more of a bought in institutionally by grid providers. Um, there, there would be a downturn. So when I'm referenced the gold, uh, we, we are in a, essentially macroeconomically a debt failure financial system for which actually there is currently no fully blown market cap similar uh, monetary system in existence. And the capital preservation instrument of choice is in fact gold in those uh, circumstances. And it's confirmed by the fact that central banks are indicating that in terms of what they are doing. Um, and if you're of the view that I have, and I could of course entirely be wrong, um, like Fergus says, we all future guesses, uh, that we're going to have the debt crisis and that it's, uh, you know, people have been talking about it for quite some time. But I think that this is going to escalate in this year, this election year to an immense degree. And we've already seen those events. In those demand destroying events, typically you get a disinflationary environment while that collapses. And that can hurt people, long oil stocks, uh, you know, offshore rigs and that category generally quite badly. Uh, because there's a, ma a massive amount of demand that gets destroyed for all forms of movement. If you have anything representing lockdowns or 2008 or um, again. So because my expectation is the bad first, then the solution, you get the, the run in the macro. Um, it's a firing order of the cylinders. We're both uh, looking at an engine and we just maybe have a different um, impression of what the firing order will be of those cylinders. That's when I expect the, the, the alternative financial system tools uh, and silver is everyday man's money and, uh, and gold is, you know, king's money. Those things overperformed. So I want to make reference to that. We, we've already seen a couple of microcosms for that. Uh, when QEQ1234 and we had the 2011 run and then also it, gold largely shrugged off the, the 20, uh, 20 events, had a short dip and then went on to make new highs at the time that oil was going the other way. So um, you could still have, you could still wet the bed in the macro commodity space, which is why I have chosen particular overweighting, possibly slightly differently to Fergus in the monetized metals. Um, and then I've given you a reason for industrial demand on silver. Anyway, your question was around the Nikkei, uh, and it ties back into the debt. To me, this whole story is the debt failure system for which, and it is the driver for commodities generally, but they don't all run together. That's why we have inflation. We've seen sugar run, you know, on the soft fronts, no one's spoken about them. We've seen all-time highs in uh, live feeder cattle and a lot of uh, things that probably are too small and uh, micro niche for this audience because we're in the big categories. Uh, but this is more about monetary debasement. The whole story is about monetary debasement. And the king of monetary debasement who doesn't have the executive privilege of um, issuance uh, of the global currency is Japan in terms of overweight uh, debt, uh, totally uh, reliant on largely it's domestic demand for buying its Japanese uh, debt and now has been self-monetizing itself because they've got the inverted demographic uh, of 0.9 uh, children for every couple. So you're not even replacing one. And you've got all of these people now drawing on their retirement. So the Japanese have a real problem. They have much lower interest rates uh, and they're starting from a far worse place. Remember, they were the first to do quantitative easing in the 80s. So I'm sketching out, again, the debt larger story is the primary story. So in my apex triangle, the whole system is monetary debasement and, de uh, and debt. And if you start right up there, this is a play that isn't a commodity play because it helps sometimes to be in other things apart from just the commodities, because if you're in every other commodity, but not the monetized metals, which are a play on the debt failure system, and we have a demand destroying event, your entire portfolio gets kicked in the backside. Uh, your sugar farms, your, your ship makers, uh, and oil producers. So um, this is an, uh, an FX stroke equ equity majors play. And the point I'll make that the, many people don't realize that the Japanese currency was one of the strongest currencies. It was actually beyond the Swiss franc in the 60s and 70s. It was super, super strong. I mean, the pound to be a 689 
yen and now it's you know it's 100 and whatever uh that has turned because of their 80s 90s experiment the zombification of the banks they got some they had a savings problem according to uh as Prof. Werner likes to highlight, according to the Fed, uh, and as a result, they took some very uh, unsensible uh, lending practices into account, which was quite counter their culture. However, in spite of a very strong currency, they built absolute world industry leaders. So every time their head office costs it being paying salaries in yen and everything like that. Now, admittedly, a lot of that is produced offshore, but still the core is disproportionately at home. They were competitive, take a company like Toyota, in an environment with a strengthening currency. Now you sit in a set of circumstances since debt uh, is now being brought into focus. They can't match America's hike in rates. So either the currency goes or the the debt market yields have to go. This is the you've got two taps to let out the pressure, and they desperately not wanting the interest rate to go too much. They're caught between a rock and a hard place, basically, uh, and they're the weakest of the first world nations. There's plenty of emerging nations, but none of them have leader equities that are absolutely dominant, even when they had a strong currency. Now the question is, how powerful will the likes of a Toyota be if they now have? Uh, a currency that is losing what it lost last year, 30%, on an ongoing macro basis until we either go into a capitulation crisis of currencies and a debt failure, um, which will also further help them, but it will be quite a terrible time for the planet. Uh, and as a result, that Nikkei trade on the majors particularly, you could obviously pick certain of the, the individual equities. We focus on that in our community. But just a net long on the Nikkei has to be uh, to us. Uh, we've got a 57,000 target technically generated. You've got to remember people spent three decades calling this one and it never came. You're talking about a peak in uh, 89 uh, and that now is the better part of 34 years ago. So if you think uranium was a long lost walk in a big desert, uh, think about the Japanese Nikkei. And yet those companies, Companies are amazing, technological leaders, innovators, most reliable products, now with a weakening currency. So I put it to you as an alternative, as a separate mix to your bag that will diversify your beta a little bit. Um, the short yen stroke long the macro Nikkei majors has to be a very interesting potential trade. And for those that think that that's already got off, as I mentioned, we've only really crossed uh, the 36 level now. It is in a bit of a blow off moment again, but we've been talking about this since it was in mid 20s. Um, but with the target that they have in mind, you could uh, do very well. You could possibly get a light leverage ETF uh, on the Nikkei 225, or you could select individual stocks, which is something we're focusing more on in our community uh, that could possibly outperform the index as well. But the big guys with shrinking cost uh, in yen generally, although there is production carried out offshore, dominating markets. I wouldn't want to be Ford or GM um, in a reducing demand environment with the Japanese companies on, on a weakening currency and reducing costs and getting extra revenue because of an FX effect as well. Uh, I think they're going to gobble up market share. Very interesting. Let's close things out with your trading and investing philosophies. Any words of wisdom you'd like to impart to people who are investing in the current market today, whether these are timeless principles or things that you think apply in particular to the market environment we're currently in? And Ferg, I'll start with you. Yeah, well, I, I just want to touch on one point around supply yeah, destruction, because I always think one, one problem we make often being based in um, the West has been very Western centric. And even if we look at the actual demand destruction that happened with say oil in the GFC or in even the lockdown was, it wasn't, it wasn't actually, a, it came nowhere near consensus. Like in with the lockdowns, it was the estimate was like 30% drawdown in oil demand. And in the end it happened, it ended up about eight and a half percent. That's like locking down the world. And then the GFC, I think it was two and a half, three percent if you did the full um, year. And so what we always forget is like the, the Western world as such is, is actually quite a small part of, um, we, we consume a lot, but it's a small part of where the growth is going to be. Like if you, if you actually break it down, I think it's 
1.6 billion people would be classified under the West and we consume 12, 13 barrels per person per year, whereas you've got the rest of the developing world, six, six, and, six and a half, and they're consuming about three barrels per person per year. And they're going to add 2 billion people um, by sort of 2050. And so that's automatically going to add 50% to the energy system if they increase their living standards, which the likes of China um, and India are then that could take it closer to four. That doubles the entire energy system. And so I'm very focused on the sort of developing side of the equation. And that's why I'm I'm quite confident, even with the all the problems, I completely agree with Francis. It's an absolute basket case with um, the developed countries and the sort of debt scenario. That's why I remain quite optimistic on sort of the longer term sort of energy demand trajectory. So I, I just wanted to um, put that as a sort of another reason why I sort of remain bullish energy overall. I could I could see some absolute disastrous scenarios, but overall I remain sort of optimistic that will work through. And it's also why I'm more inclined to go after the guys with like the large margin of safety. Like I was talking about, like these these drillers popping out um, from restructurings with net cash, the likes of um, some of the ones I was talking about that even cash exceeded the market cap for a little while. So I can actually wait to see what I expect to happen on for a longer term. Um, but yes, as for your, sorry, I got off a little tangent there. But No, your, no, I, I, uh, I love this. I love that both of you guys don't agree on absolutely everything and, and hearing yeah. both of your your theories and, and your thesis, theses are uh, are excellent. So I'll always appreciate that. Yes, as for um, sort of trading process or um, lessons, I just think it's to, to really resist FOMO like it, it's the only thing that's I, I feel like it's what I'm kind of known for is just like cons- constantly hanging out in the hated areas like be where people are going to FOMO in a few years like be that place at the moment where people are like fire sailing something because they want to chase the FOMO like it was what I was talking about before a position I love I see it sold off five percent because it's in the ASX because people are just um are just wanting to chase um chase uranium at the moment and so I'll be there buying that thing that I think was already undervalued when it's been sold off more. It's um, it's always it's always trying to foresee where where the market will be focused in another few years. Like every everyone's playing the game of chasing it at this particular time, and that that's super hard. It's um, if you get into uranium now, it's going to be a hell of a volatile ride, and the asymmetry is just not there. The um, well, it could be there, as I said. Like everyone's got different um, different things they want out, and so they could still take multi bagger. But um, it'll be a far more volatile ride. Whereas getting in earlier, understanding that this game takes a lot of patience and stomaching a lot of volatility. That's um, one of one of my favorite articles ever written. That or well, it's actually a study that people can go and look up is uh, why God would get fired as an active investor, and it's the idea that. Um, could have God that would um, could look forward. I forget the time frame. Is, uh, I think it was three years, maybe five years, and he would know exactly the the sort of the basket of stocks that would be the highest performer in the world. He could select exactly those stocks, take in money as an active investor, and he would get fired. He would run too much volatility over the time frame to realize the return. And once you understand that, you get back to the sort of the Bill Miller observation that. Volatility really is the price you pay for performance. And so being early, understanding, having having conviction, understanding the thesis so you can weather a lot of um, volatility and then understand where the world's going in a few years, not not FOMO into what's working at, at any particular point in time and having a very disciplined approach to get now because there's the world's full of people that were paper millionaires at some time, at some point and didn't realize anything it's um it's extremely hard to exit well so that yeah cool. that, that that brings to mind a, a tweet i believe you once made something about like you're going to be early out of the trade you're going to leave money on the table deal with it you know that, that that's just one of the realities if um if you don't want to experience a brutal correction we saw in the last uranium bull market obviously the price massively spike and collapse so 
um, that can happen to you if you stay in the trade for too long. Francis, any any words of wisdom, any uh, trading or investing philosophies that you adhere to that you think could be useful for people out there? Yes, uh, a short mention uh, on my tangent again, uh, ref, uh, the assumptions uh, with Fergus. I'm maybe more cynical and possibly a bit more dark, but I don't think, A, the demographics and the population growth curve mathematics can be uh, overly assumed. I feel there's forces that are working uh, against us at a fertility level, at a health and longevity level. I don't want to get too uh, conspiratorial. Uh, it's not the place. But I think we're going to, uh, with the energy numbers, I, I also think we've got to uh, factor in the collapse of the West. So the notion of 1.6 billion in the West uh, on 4.5 barrels, that can that both numbers could come down markedly, even with an environment of the other numbers going up. Um, and I, I, so I would uh, I would say energy is is a good place, but uh, just bear that bear those numbers in mind. We continue to assume a growing population, and I think that's uh, there is an assumption in that. Uh, anywhere in the world that might not be holding. Um, and I do a whole reset snipe on why I think those things. Um, so that's just one counterpoint. Um, in terms of uh, most of what Fergus said on uh, the sense, it's just pure sense what he said. Um, my my primary, is, I start with the beginning and the problem is leverage. Uh, so leverage should almost not be used. It's something you earn the right to. You have to show both the patience and the mentality and the wherewithal to uh, initially invest and hold and very, very unique occasions should leverage be brought to bear. And we have a very specific setup that requires a whole bunch of things technically. And I think the equivalent of a final capitulation in March 2020 on the uranium market could be a fundamental example of where a small amount of leverage, like 50%, uh, or possibly uh, double. And in most events, leverage do more harm than good uh, in terms of uh, people. Uh, so start with investing and earn your right to leverage, prove your patience, which would be my second point. Uh, very judicious use to no use of leverage and then patience. Leverage is handed out like, uh, you know, um, I want 45 cold magnums with hairline triggers in a crash. You know, uh, it ends in blood and uh, spatter uh, generally. Um, and, and it's the part of the interest. You are treated as the dumb money and it's your donation to uh, the institutional feed mechanism. So uh, as again, my slight cynicism coming through there. Um, patience is the fact that we we have too much of a, uh, a buy now. We have a consumption approach to everything. In fact, buy now, pay later is an example of it. And you you want your you know you want your gains as soon as you put it in. As like you've, as if you bought a product, um, you haven't. And I see this in the silver investing space where people probably were bleating much like they were in the uranium uh, space that uh, Fergus would have had to put up with when he was first floating the thesis. In other words, the long view, people aren't ready to be God. They aren't ready to get in low. They aren't ready to see the reasons. And actually the best time those reasons are is when everything else is quiet. I had one person saying that your the market on about is so boring. And to me that, thank you. Yes, that's awesome. I'm so excited. Uh, and he, of course, sees it as a negative. So the whole concept is that completely gone to sleep in a fundamental sense. And we get the price behavior equivalent of that uh in the technical analysis so the technical analysis works with the fundamental people need to be far more patient they need to know or earn the right to leverage and use it very judiciously at really unique moments and they used to take uh the, the longer the view uh the better you do is my uh take as well i'm not interested there's no nine screens there's no 15 minute charts um, the only time we'll look at a small time frame chart is if we're actually getting a technical setup in a much larger technical setup, possibly even, even at a bigger one. Uh, and we saw that in the Nikkei. We're seeing that in RAN weakness right now. And we're seeing, uh, we think we're going to be seeing that uh, equivalently in a couple of other unique events. And that's when you can get risk reward based matrices. So I always encourage people, if you are utilizing any leverage, you need to have a point where you accept you're wrong. And that becomes your takeoff. And you need to write it down. And it's a covenant with self. Learn to have the self-discipline of covenant of self. Actually, the, the, the notion that traders were these 
flaming Ferrari, swooshing, um, you know, living high on the hog, cocaine snorting uh, heroes uh, or fund managers or that is absolutely further from, it couldn't be further from the truth. That's usually the brokers that get paid on flow that charge around uh, bulls in China shops. The, the very best traders were triathletes, married, Dalton Gray men who were deeply disciplined uh, and, uh, you know, really focused up early and on it. Uh, and you need to you need to develop that long time frame, high discipline. That means you're healthy, smart, non-toxic, uh, and you're not prone to snappy, highly emotional decisions. They've steady of hand. And we can all be that if we live that life. You know, I have to literally eliminate caffeine and sugar to be that guy. <laughs> Um, other people will maybe be better set than me. I would say, you know, I've probably got bad genes uh, for it. Uh, but I'm basically reiterating in my own words, many of the points that Fergus raised along the lines of patience uh, and be early rather than seek to chase in. Yeah. And I, I love that uh, touch of of mentioning physical health as well. I think that's very important because that feeds into mental health, feeds into our emotional state and being able to control it and, and keep it um, under wraps when when you're prone to FOMO or, or overreactions and things like that. Well, gentlemen, it's been an incredible conversation. I learned a ton. I know everybody watching did as well. Before I do let you guys go, uh, Ferg, tell us about your sub stack and anywhere else you'd like to direct people online. Yeah, no, thank you, Jesse. Um, yeah, my sub stack's where I pen all my thoughts now it's um it's been running six months i've been really enjoying it um it's just me with my views what i'm doing with my portfolio is 90 percent of it um just changes where i'm positioning um i'm reasonably regularly getting someone um sort of a expert in from an industry i'm interested in or quite often another sort of fund manager to um, pick their brain on something i'm interested in and yeah, that's it. So that's just um, Trader Ferg at Substack. And that's 90% of what I put out, really. I've kind of eased off on Twitter, haven't really been enjoying it for a while. So yeah, it's Substack's really um, where I put stuff out in the world now. Great. I'll put a link to that in the description below. And Francis, tell us about the Market Sniper, where people can find that and anywhere else you'd like to direct people online. Yeah, we talk about our views on the YouTube channel, The Market Sniper. That's probably the first place. Um, we have a website under the same name as well if people want to book a call uh, and develop that investing long-term occasional trader with light leverage approach. Um, we, we also have a substack for a newsletter where mainly I'm, I'm quite short of um, writing. It's easier to talk than type for me, um, but it's quite visual as well. So we look at the charts. You might even disagree, but I do feel the footsteps in the sand are the track and those are the charts. And that's unarguable. People can sometimes have half the facts or not the full story or make certain assumptions, but we can't. We can't assume the price and the price is uh, overtaken over a long course of period is the pathway. Uh, and we look at that and we, we see a lot of insights uh, in technical analysis. And it's usually backed with a fundamental narrative as well. And we're very comfortable with uh, positioning early, which means sometimes contrarianly to uh, the rest of the market. Uh, so join us on the YouTube channel. Uh, we have a sub stack as well under the market sniper for those very short missives with charts. Great. Well, I'll put links to that in the description below as well. Gentlemen, it's been a real honor. Thanks for coming on the show.